an extract from The Adventure of the Bruce Partington Plans by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, in which I play the part of Dr Watson. In the third week of November, in the year 1895, a dense yellow fog settled down upon London. From the Monday to the Thursday, I doubt whether it was ever possible from our windows in Baker Street to see the loom of the opposite houses. The first day Holmes had spent in cross-indexing his huge book of references. The second and third had been patiently occupied upon a subject which he had recently made his hobby, the music of the Middle Ages. But when, for the fourth time, after pushing back our chairs from breakfast, we saw the greasy, heavy brown swirl still drifting past us and condensing in oily drops upon the window panes. My comrade's impatient and active nature could endure this drab existence no longer. He paced restlessly about our sitting room in a fever of suppressed energy, biting his nails, tapping the furniture and chafing against inaction. An extract from Alphabetical Order by Michael Frayn, in which I play the part of John. I think all I'm saying is this. Does one want to be quite so, as it were, pigeonholed? I'm not saying one doesn't. Perhaps one does. I'm merely being a channel through which an unasked question can get itself asked because one would be making a fairly definite statement about oneself. Would we be, as the phrase goes, happy about saying we live in a converted stable block? Imagine what you'd think if you met someone at a party who said we live in a converted stable block. I mean, I liked it as a place. I liked the little cobbled yard. I liked the pots of geraniums. I didn't much like the dustbins. No, no, no I, I, I did quite like the dustbins. In a way, I like the dustbins more than the geraniums. I thought the dustbins left more, as it were, scope for the imagination. But the whole place does shout, as it were, nice young couple with intellectual tastes and, as yet, no children. Mm, don't you think? Honestly? This is Sonnet Number 137 by William Shakespeare. Thou blind fool, love, what dost thou to mine eyes, that they behold and see not what they see? They know what beauty is, see where it lies, yet what the best is, take the worst to be. If eyes corrupt by over-partial looks be anchored in the bay where all men ride, why of eyes falsehood hast thou forged hooks where to the judgment of my heart is tied? Why should my heart think that a several plot which my heart knows the wide world's common place? Or mine eyes, seeing this, say this is not to put fair truth upon so foul a face? In things right true my heart and eyes have erred, and to this false plague are they now transferred. An extract from A Monday Morning on the London Underground by the reader. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your driver giving you an update. I apologise that we have made absolutely no progress for the last hour and 17 minutes. Rest assured that our dedicated engineers are now on the case and are working non-stop between tea breaks. We sincerely hope to have you moving again within the next 48 hours. I will admit that today is not a good day for the service on the London Underground. In fact, the words abominable, deplorable and shambolical don't even begin to cover it. For starters, the central line has minor delays. However, fear not, 
we shall have it running smoothly again just as soon as the miners are released. Durndale Brook, a poem by Ione Rosevere. Starting as a tiny trickle new, over centuries it gurgled and grew, winding its way through wood and vale, until it reached that house in the dale, under the bridge by the front drive gate, between walls of stone at a steady rate, no longer guarding prisoners in jail, but the banks from rats, voles and rail. Past the pool where they washed the hides, tumbling over the waterfall, it onward glides. Through nodding daffs and white-faced cows, the lower orchard neath low-slung boughs. Fishermen's hail, the sling and meadows green, to vetchy lands and the border is seen. Now I suppose it's the Wellington brook, hurrying on by crook and by nook. A monologue from Much Ado About Nothing by William Shakespeare, in which I play the part of Benedict. I do much wonder that one man, seeing how much another man is a fool when he dedicates his behaviours to love, will, after he hath laughed at such shallow follies in others, become the argument of his own scorn by falling in love. And such a man is Claudio. I have known when there was no music with him but the drum and the fife, and now had he rather hear the tabor and the pipe. I have known when he would have walked ten mile afoot to see a good armour, and now will he lie ten nights awake, carving the fashion of a new doublet. He was wont to speak plain and to the purpose like an honest man and a soldier, and now is he turned orthographer, his words are a very fantastic fantastical banquet, just so many strange dishes. May I be so converted and see with these eyes? I cannot tell. I think not. I will not be sworn, but love may transform me to an oyster. But I'll take my oath on it. Till he have made an oyster of me, he shall never make me such a fool. My week by the reader. Dear Diary, I must say it's been a busy week. I went into central London on Monday and after lunch walked past Clarence House, where I was convinced I saw Prince Charles in his office, poring over some documents. Ah, poor Prince Charles. He never reigns, but he pours. Tuesday was a disappointment. I sat down to watch a programme called The First Exit on the Roundabout, but turned off immediately. The next day, my friend rang to say that she started this increasingly popular 5-2 diet. She has a walnut whip at 5 to 11, a box of biscuits at 5 to 12, and a four-course lunch at 5 to 1. When Thursday came round, I thought it was high time I had a bath. So I went online and ordered one. On Friday, I was invited to a gathering of retired shoe repairers. Very badly run. Everyone was talking at the same time. I'd never heard such a load of old cobblers. Then, last night, my sister gave birth to a little boy. They've made sure he doesn't pick up the telephone at home for fear that he might be targeted by cold callers, because apparently these firms have most success with people who were born yesterday.